Hey. Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is John Wu, and uh, tonight uh, I'm going to be your host. Although I, I guess for some of you, it's still in the afternoon, eh? so <laughs> that's always a little bit funny with time differences. So uh, welcome once again. Uh, as a sort of a quick introduction to myself, uh, I'm a recent graduate from Osgood Hall Law School and the Schulich School of Business. Um, and for the last three years or so, I've been teaching the law, um, you know, really as a sort of a passion of mine. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people who actually really, really love the law. I think it's super interesting and super fascinating. Um, and I did want to sort of share my love with it, uh, love for it with, with others, right? Um, and one thing that I noticed that was that there wasn't a ton of opportunities to really get involved at the high school level. So it's really because of that that I ended up starting this organization called Dominion Mock Trial. Um, so this event is being held on behalf of Dominion. Um, I'm here to speak with you, but we have an entire team of people who are sort of helping make sure everything happens. So I want to just give a shout out to our fantastic team. So if uh, anyone of you is interested in engaging a little bit more, feel free to turn on your cameras or not, you know, during this class. Um, it's really up to you and depending on your level of comfort. In general, for these classes, uh, you know, I typically prefer, you know, the students engage a little bit, right? That way, if there's anything that is unclear, anything that is confusing, uh, you can ask questions and just jump in. Um, also, with your cameras on, I can sort of, you know, get a rough sense of, on the feel of the room, which can be a little tough during online stuff, right? Um, and that gives me a better idea on whether I should slow down or speed up, uh, as well as if I should be, you know, spending a little bit longer discussing a particular topic. So I understand many of you are really new to mooting. So, you know, today we're going to be, you know, running over how do you actually handle a moot? Um, it's something that is not really done at the high school level, but our goal is to make it so that you will be able to. Um, and you'll find that it is surprisingly easy. Um, you know, at least compared to a lot of other activities like debate and mock trial, there are surprisingly fairly few rules. Uh, but there are some that you're going to have to know. Um, and the purpose of today is to really go over some of those rules and also to give you an example of really how to read a case, right? Which is, I, I know something that sounds quite scary, but I promise you it's not that bad. So just as a sort of a quick introduction, um, does anyone know like what mooting is? Has anyone heard of it before? Seeing a lot of sort of puzzled faces. <laughs> so my gut feeling is probably not. So most people have heard of like a mock trial, right? Which is like a simulated court battle, right? You play the part of lawyers, you go in and you argue a case. Uh, mooting is very similar to a mock trial, except instead of doing a trial, uh, you're arguing an appeal. And an appeal is basically when you are challenging a trial decision, right? When you're reviewing one. Uh, the most famous appeal court is, of course, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, right? So, you know, if, if you want to think about it this way, you want to think about it like not all courts are equal. Some courts are more important than others, right? And the more important the court, uh, the bigger the, the impact their decisions have. So mooting is basically about the sort of more important courts, if you want to think about it that way. Um, these are very high impact decisions. And they're also fit a little bit more complicated, right? Um, and we'll get into exactly why that is in a moment. Uh, but it's a very common sort of activity that's done through university and law school level. And in terms of legal competitions, it's like, you know, sort of the go-to in the world. Uh, you know, mock trials are done, but mooting is much more common, especially as you reach higher levels. And our hope through today is to, you know, give you a sort of a baseline. So in the future, if you are interested in, you know, doing legal competitions in undergrad, or potentially doing in law school, right? Uh, you can be all set up. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at a case. Um, and if you are interested in looking at this case further, you can download it from our website. Um, so typically during a moot uh, at this level, you will be provided with something called a memo. And I'll put it off on my screen right here. So this is a, a memo. And a legal memo is basically just a, sort of a quick bit of writing that someone put together to basically summarize a case for you, right? So that you don't have to read through the entire case. It pinpoints like what are the important things to know, right? 
So the first thing to know is that uh, this case is called RV Gauthier, right? So in this case, we have R, which is the crown, and Gauthier, who is, of course, the defendant, right? And here we see that Gauthier has appealed to the Dominion Court of Canada. So this is a fictional court, right? Uh, so if we take a look at this case, it's a Supreme Court decision. So we're pretending, right? We're pretending here that there's an even higher level of court than the Supreme Court, right? There's an even higher level than the Supreme Court. And this is where you're making our arguments, right? Um, so, you know, most moots will deal with Supreme Court decisions. Uh, these are often the most complex decisions, but they're also the most interesting, right? And, you know, frankly, it's like every lawyer's dream to present before the Supreme Court, right? And that, that's really what mooting is meant to sort of emulate. Um, so here we see that Gauche has appealed to the fictional court. So in other words, Gauche is appealing. What does that mean to appeal? Um, well, it means that Gauthier lost, right? Uh, whoever this Gauthier person is, they lost at the Supreme Court. They, they didn't end up winning. So now they're, they're not happy about that decision and they're saying, hey, look, we're gonna make an appeal to an even higher ranking court, right? In this case, the Dominion Court of Canada. So there's gonna be two teams involved in this. There's the appellant who's representing Ms. Gauthier. And this is pretty straightforward. The appellant is whoever is doing the appeal, right? They're the challenger. They're, uh, they're trying to challenge the previous court's decision. Contrasted with the respondent, uh, and this is the responding team, the team that is saying, hey, uh, nope, the previous court got it right. We should maintain the Supreme Court's decision, right? Um, so usually there's a quick introduction and following that there's a judicial history. So the judicial history basically tells you like the history of this case, right? How did this case go from one court to the next? So here, uh, you know, we can get a rough sense on what's going on here. Um, Ms. Goche got charged with three counts of first degree murder. So that's a pretty serious case. Um, and then, you know, she used two different defenses. Um, you know, so the judicial history gives you like a sort of a breakdown really of, you know, where this case was in the past, right? Um, most of these moot cases will be modified in order to adjust the level of difficulty. So for instance, in this, uh, in this case, you know, there are some issues which I will say, you know, you don't have to worry about that, right? So, you know, if it tells you not to worry about it, don't worry about it. Like these memos usually will tell you what to focus on, right? What's, what's really relevant. Um, so moving on from like this sort of summary, right? Uh, here we can see that there is one issue on appeal. Uh, so usually when it comes to these appeals, it deals with like one very specific issue, right? There's only one really specific issue to argue. And in this case, uh, the Supreme Court is trying to figure out uh, what is the test for the defense of abandonment? Does anyone have any ideas like what a test might be? Like, what, what do you think a test is? Law students, you should know this. We've done several tests before. <laughs> yeah, so what's like a legal, legal test? I mean, I guess one example would be the Oaks test, but that's kind of different than I guess this case. Yeah, um, it is a different test, but yeah, that's a, that's probably like the example of a test in Canada, right? Like the Oaks test. That's the test you use to determine the constitutionality of something, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, and Edward, I see, yeah, like I think it's a set of requirements that needs to be fulfilled. Exactly, it's a set of requirements that need to be fulfilled. So in this case, like the question is, did they, correctly use the right test for the defense of abandonment, right? So this is often the sort of issue that we're trying to tackle at the Supreme Court level, right? Like, are they actually using the right legal test for it? Um, the defense of abandonment is, you know, in, in this case, you know, and I'm, I don't want to get too deep into the substance, like the main thing here is figuring out the strategy, right? Uh, the defense of abandonment is basically the defense that you raise when you're a part of a crime, and then you leave. So long story short, in this case, uh, Ms. Gauthier was uh, basically a woman who was kind of depressed and she and her husband hatched a really, really evil plan to murder their three kids. And, you know, it, it was a really tragic circumstance. Uh, they were very poor. Both of them had like very severe mental illness issues, right? They were in a really bad spot. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, her and her husband made an agreement that they would go off and, you know, kill their three kids and then kill themselves, right? because they didn't feel like there was any point in living any longer. 
So what ended up happening was Miskolci sort of backed out at the last moment, right? Right, right before the crime was about to happen, she kind of had a change of mind and was like, oh my gosh, I, I can't be a part of this. This is not good, right? And according to Mrs. Golchi, Ms. Golchi, uh, she thought that she had convinced her husband to stop the crime, right? She's like, oh, I told him we couldn't do this. And by the look on his face, it seemed like he said, yeah, you know what, let's not do this, right? But he never gave verbal confirmation. And the big thing was the murder weapon. So the murder weapon in this case was poison. There were these drugs that were bought that were lethal in high enough doses. The person that bought them was Miss Gauthier. So after Miss Gauthier said, hey, we can't do this, she uh, basically went with her husband, took the kids and they watched the movie and they had some popcorn and drinks. You can probably see where this is going. When Ms. Gauthier woke up, her entire family was dead. It's a very tragic circumstance. And, uh, you know, this is a real case, right? Like, uh, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, you know, truly, truly tragic. So now the, the courts, what they're trying to figure out is, is Ms. Gauthier still a part of that crime, basically, right? Is she still a part of the crime? Or did she leave the crime when she said, hey, we can't do this? Right. And there's a lot of arguments both ways, right? I mean, on the one hand, Ms. Gauthier plotted to kill her own kids. She went out and bought a murder weapon to kill her own kids. She wrote up a set of documents with her husband saying, hey, here's our plan. We're going to kill our kids. She encouraged her husband to kill their kids. That's a pretty monstrous thing to do, isn't it? To facilitate the murder of your own kids. Like, that's terrible, right? But then on the other hand, Ms. Gauthier is also a victim in a lot of ways, right? She has gone through a very rough time in her life. She was assaulted and that caused a whole bunch of issues which manifested later on. Her husband and her didn't have any work. They were about to be kicked out of their apartment. They didn't know what they were gonna do. And despite the terrible actions she did, she did repent for a moment, right? In those final moments before that fateful murder, she did, according to the evidence, make some argument that they can't do this. So the question now is, what do we do with Ms. Gochi, right? So at this point, um, it is worth considering. So this is at the Supreme Court level. At trial, which is probably something you're much more used to hearing about, right? That's where you have all the witnesses and the evidence and stuff like that. There was all the witnesses and all the evidence, all that was brought forward, right? Um, and the evidence does show that, you know, she, she seemed to have made some genuine effort to stop her husband. She, you know, swore on oath that she said, no, we can't do this. She ripped up some of the documents that they had prepared beforehand, right? So it seemed like she was making some kind of effort to prevent her husband. But what ended up happening was the judge at trial said no to the lawyers when they tried to raise the defense of abandonment, the idea that she attempted to abandon the crime, right? So her lawyers basically want to argue, our client abandoned the crime, therefore you cannot hold her responsible, right? Her husband is the murderer. She's merely just another victim in this situation, right? Um, but the judge wouldn't allow that, right? And the main reason that the judge wouldn't allow that was because of the test for the defense of abandonment, right? So that's really why the test is so important, right? Because on appeal, what you're really doing is you're saying the judge is wrong. That's what, really what you're doing on an appeal. Right? That's the argument that you're making. And that's a very big, bold claim to make. Uh, judges have been working for a very long time as a lawyer. They are more knowledgeable about the law than just anybody else, right? And you gotta you know, go up there and say, yeah, this judge is wrong. And I have the facts and the evidence to prove it, 
right? So that's a pretty pretty bold claim, right? Um, but you know, she, she managed to do it, right? She, her lawyers managed to submit a decent enough argument where it was accepted for appeal. And it was accepted for appeal again after, you know, that court couldn't quite figure it exactly what was going on, right? So now we're at the Supreme Court level. And, you know, this is something that you have all these judges and they can't figure out exactly what happened, right? So it's a genuinely complicated issue. There's no clear cut answer to this case. There's no simple solution, right? It involves a ton of, a ton of, you know, different policy considerations in terms of what are we trying to do here? What's the right thing to do, right? What's fair? Ms. Gauthier in this case is not asking for her to be let off completely scot-free. That's not what she's asking for, right? Uh, what she's asking for in this case is another trial. And the idea is if she gets another trial, her lawyers will actually get a chance to submit the defense of abandonment, right? Her lawyers will actually be able to go up there and say, look, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client has clearly fulfilled the steps of the defense of abandonment. You know, she attempted to stop her husband, right? She showed an intention to try to stop him. You know, she did this, she did this, she did this, right? In an attempt to like do that. She didn't get that chance at trial. And now she's appealing to the Supreme Court so that she can have a do over a new trial essentially, so that she can overturn her conviction, right? Because she was convicted. She, she is, as it stands right now, guilty, but maybe in the future she won't be. So I, uh, I would be quite curious, you know, any, any thoughts uh, as far as this case goes? Um, how about you, Phoebe? Any, uh, what, what are your leanings so far? Um, I feel like, she did do wrong but she did also change her mind as you said so i feel like she shouldn't be charged as heavily because yeah she did try to stop it and she yeah had a change of heart yes so you're saying that a change of heart should be enough to allow you to you know not not be charged in this case not necessarily not be charged but just not be as charged mm -hmm. as heavily because as heavily okay yeah, that, that's an interesting point that you raised there. Yeah, um, the it, main issue for that in this case, and yeah, it's it's a good point, Phoebe, and it is something that you know, in a maybe in an idealized situation, you know, it could be possible, right? You know, given the sympath relatively sympathetic circumstances and the you know uncertain facts, um, the main issue in this case is it's three counts of first degree murder, so it's three counts of the single most serious crime in the country. So if she gets convicted, she's going away for a very long time. There's really not a lot of room for leniency on the part of the judges. Um, and at the end of the day, like either she is guilty or she's not guilty, right? So that's that's the sort of tricky thing. So um, yeah, like I, I like the way you're thinking there in terms of you know figuring out like you know does the punishment fit the crime, right? In this case, like it does seem like she, you know, it's it's a fairly sympathetic situation, you know, as far as uh, you know the whole murdering kids go, right? But, you know, unfortunately, in this case, there's really no room for any leniency as far as the law goes. Uh, what about you, Roland? Any, any thoughts? Um, not, no, I, I think I, I would generally agree with what Phoebe said. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who would say the exact opposite? Who would say that, you know? Uh... Um, yeah, I'd say, like, while it's sure like it's important to consider a change of heart the fact that she was still intending to go through with it until like the very last moment brings into question what her personal morals are and say even if she does have a change of heart like what does that mean for her as a person and again going back to the point of how she was planning on doing this how she even bought the murder weapon like it's one thing to just say oh i changed my mind but it's another thing to have planned out the entire thing um, and be on the verge of going through with it and then saying, I changed my mind. Yeah. So that, that's a great point. Is, is your name Caden? Uh, yeah, my name. Oh, so my goodness. So, yeah, my name is Caden. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Camille. I'm Caden. Camille, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see someone uh, shot me a message. Anna is asking, what is the evidence that she changed her mind? Well, um, in this case, like, you know, we can take a look at the evidence actually in a second. Um, where is it? 
So here, like, you know, they give you a summary of the law. So, you know, they tell you like, here, here's the criminal code that she's being charged with, right? And she's being charged with a uh, section 21.1 here. Um, aiders and abettors. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, you know the, the memos will always like sort of break down the law for you. But, you know, the memos will only give you like the rough outline of what information you're looking for, right? Uh, if you actually want the facts, we have to take a look at the Supreme Court decision itself. And we'll get to that in just a second. But in terms of the evidence that ch changed her mind, um, yeah, let's, let's hold off on that for one second, yeah. Uh, but I think Camille raised a pretty good point there, which is that, you know, you can't be super involved with the crime, change your mind, and then all of a sudden you're innocent, right? Like that seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Imagine if I planned out a bank robbery with a few of my friends, right? And not saying I would, but hypothetically, I'm planning out a bank robbery uh, with, uh, you know, Kaden and Camille. Right, the three of us are planning a bank robbery. Um, you know, Caden goes over and uh, he's like, "Oh, hey, uh, John, you're responsible for grabbing the guns and the map and doing the drive. You know, doing the getaway car, right?" And I'm like, "Okay, sure." Uh, you know, and I go over and I gather up a bunch of really illegal firearms. I gather up like the plans to the bank and I hand them over, right? And then, like on the day of the robbery, you know, I get sick and I'm like, "Yo, you know what, guys? I uh, I'm not feeling so well. I I don't want to do this anymore." Right, I got a bit of a bit of a cold. Um, so then, you know, Kate and Camille, unfortunately, end up do getting busted. You know, uh, the Mounties, uh, Mounties, you know, really, really furious car chase. You know, they they managed to catch up, um, and you know, they're like, yeah, you know what, like, how, how do we get the guns? Oh yeah, it was this guy John, right? So so in, in a situation like that, like, is it really fair for me to get off scot free, even though I contributed so much to that crime, right? Doesn't this encourage people to like do a bunch of crimes and then just be like, oh, I changed my mind. And then I think in that I think in that particular instance, like a physical illness is different than just saying, oh, I changed my mind. Um, like that's of course specific to that situation. Mm -hmm. But at least from what she've said in this case, um Ms. Gautier was the one who convinced her husband to do it, and then was the one that withdrew at the end am i right um so it was more of a sort of a joint effort i, sh I, I okay should, I okay should say, yeah the, both of them came up with the plan together yeah so i think that that's where that differs from this hypothetical in the sense that in the bank robbery situation we're the ones telling you okay why don't you go get this and do all this and then we'll do mm -hmm. the robbery whereas in the court case it's saying okay we're both going to do this uh, so you're saying like the first, the person who's driving it has more responsibility than the person who's just being sort of dragged along, right? Yeah, I'd say it's even like sort of a middleman situation. Like how much responsibility are you going to put on the middleman if it's ultimately you and the other party that's doing it? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's uh, you know, unfortunately, the law doesn't quite distinguish it to that extent. Like. And, you know, all these questions, you can, you know, sort of take a look, right? And this is dense information, but you just want to sort of take a look and Google is your best friend in these situations, right? That's where you can just learn so much about this. Um, but the specific section here is, yeah, aiders and abettors. So it tells you aiders and abettors, right? So an aider and abettor is a party to an offense. So they're part of one party, right? Uh, there are parties to a crime ultimately committed by someone else, the principal of that offender. So like you said, right, there's a principal offender and then there's an aider and abettor. Right. So typically an aider helps the principal commit the crime, whereas an abettor is generally limited to encouraging them to commit an act. So an aider will help them do the crime itself. And a better would be like, hey, you should go do this. Right. And this law makes sense. Why? Because, you know, if I'm like manipulating someone else to do my crimes for me. Right. I'm every bit of as guilty of it as that person. Right. Uh, it, it shouldn't be the case that just because I'm like some big mafia boss, I'm like, oh, you go do my dirty work for me. That like, it's like, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't shoot the guy. You know, I just ordered my goons to do it. Right? That would make no sense at all. Um, but the key here, the thing is an aider and a better found guilty of criminal conduct is punished in the same way as the principal offender. So even if you're just a helper, you still get punished the exact same way. So that's something to keep in mind as well, right? So it's really for this reason that Ms. Gauthier was found on, found liable for all the first degree murders, even though her husband was actually the person who committed the murders, right? So, you know, this is where a lot of the trickiness of this comes in. And, 
you know, to, to get a much better idea of this case itself, let's take a look at the actual Supreme Court decision. So when you're when you're looking at a moot court case, the first thing you do is always read the memo. <laughs> like, don't make it any more difficult on yourself than it is. You don't have to read the entire Supreme Court case. These decisions are super long. Like this one's like probably 70 pages. You don't have to read all of it. Not all of it is relevant, right? Um, you're gonna want to do like a quick control F. That th this is this is you know this is how legal research is done, right? You look at a case, you do a control F, and you can you know pinpoint the issues that you're looking for, right? Um, so let's take a quick look at the Supreme Court just to get a rough idea of like what the layout looks like. Um, so this is a Supreme Court case. You know all the key information is here. Um, you're gonna want to scroll down, and this is important. So in every Supreme Court decision, um, and not in every one, I should say, but in every Supreme Court decision that you are mooting, there's two sides, right? In this case, there is the majority and the dissent. So the Supreme Court is actually made up of a number of judges. And that's something that makes moot court different than mock trial, right? In mock trial, you'll have one judge who is presiding and maybe a jury. In moot court, you have multiple judges forming a panel. And the idea is at the end of every Supreme Court or appeal court session, right? Uh, the judges will have a vote. And they'll have a vote on which side they think wins, which side made the better arguments, right? So there's a lot of disagreement on the Supreme Court, um, which just goes to show like, you know, this is genuinely tricky stuff. Um, you know, judges have trouble figuring out what's right and wrong in these cases, right? Um, so taking a look at it. So as you can see, almost every single judge agreed that in this case, the crown, Her Majesty the Queen should win. And only one judge, Justice Fish. So whenever you see something J, like it's just justice, right? So this is Justice Wagner, uh, who is like the sort of current uh, Supreme Supreme Court Chief Justice, right? Um, and then LaBelle, Abella, Rossi, Moldaver, and Carrot Sanis all concur. All of them agree with Wagner's arguments, whereas uh, Justice Fish was just there on his own. So I see a question from Kozar asking, what is the role of the intervener? That's a really good question. Uh, so the intervener is basically someone who presents arguments, but they're not a party to the case, right? Because the Supreme Court decision is so important, like every single law, this, you know, every single case the Supreme Court decides is like, you know, like a big landmark case, right? It shapes the way law works in this country. So because the policies are so important, oftentimes you'll have other people who have like an interest in fighting the case, right? They might not be one of the parties, but they're gonna be saying something like, hey, you know, this case really affects us. We gotta do something. We gotta, you know, make our voices heard, right? So that's what the intervener is. So in this case, we have uh, Kathy Golchi, the appellant, Her Majesty the Queen, the respondent, and uh, we saw in this case that, you know, all the judges voted for the crown. So in real life, uh, Ms. Gauthier did end up losing the case. She did not get a second trial. She is currently in jail to this date, right? But for the purposes of, you know, this sort of hypothetical exercise, she still has another shot. She has one final opportunity to get a new trial, right? So going down into the case, um, in the very beginning, there is a summary like a very short summary really of what it's about, right? Um, and, you know, so there's like a quick little summary of the facts here, right? Um, and then they give you like a sort of a breakdown. They give you like a breakdown of what everyone's saying. So it says held, right? With Justice Fish dissenting, the appeal should be dismissed. So this is the final decision of the court. They held that the appeal should be dismissed. Ms. Gauthier goes to jail. She does not get a second chance, right? Um, and, you know, they, they give a sort of a very short summary of their arguments here, and as well as a very short summary of Justice Fish's arguments. So now that we know what the Supreme Court decision looks like, right? So in every Supreme Court decision, there's a majority and a dissent. So let's just say for the exercise, you are representing Ms. Golchi, right? You're heading into moot court, you're heading to the Dominion Court, which is even higher than the Supreme Court. You're representing Ms. Golchi. Which of these arguments do you want to focus on? You might want to reintroduce the uh, point that wasn't used as much, uh, which was the point that I read earlier about 
her not being in the right state of mind while making the decisions and then backing out while in a clearer state of mind. Yeah. So I should have clarified, like in the memo itself, it actually does tell you not to deal with that issue. <laughs> oh, does it? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, it, it's asking you only to deal with like, what, what is the correct test, right? What is the cor correct parameters for the defense of abandonment? Um, but yeah, that is one argument that you could raise, right? If there was another appeal, right? Because the higher rank court can just say, yeah, the Supreme Court's wrong. They don't know what they're doing. We're going to overrule them, right? So Joanna, I see, I see you answered dissent, and that's exactly right, right? So dissent is always siding with whoever lost, right? Whoever makes arguments for the dissent, in other words, they, they sided with the losing side. And if you're the appellant, it means you're representing the losing side, right? You're representing the side that lost, and you're representing the side that's here to try to win, right? Whereas if you're representing the crown in this case, right, if you're representing the government, the prosecution, well, you're going to want to take a look at the majority argument, right? You're going to want to take a look at Justice Wagner's argument. So the nice thing about moot court, at least when you're doing a real case, is a lot of the arguments are already articulated for you, right? You have arguments literally made by the finest legal minds in the country, and they're presented to you. So that you can see what the best lawyers in the country came up came up with, right? Uh, and that that does save a lot of time from you having to you know uh, you know come up with your own arguments and you know you know like do a ton of research, right? Um, you know this is not a, like a research exercise. This is you know to see how well you can learn and argue an actual case, right? Um, it's not about you know how well you know how to do, use all the different legal research tools. So all the research is done. You have the best possible arguments that you can probably get in the country presented to you, right? Uh, your, your sort of main goal is to, you know, go through them and understand them, right? Uh, to go through them and understand them and then reframe them, right? Like you don't just want to go up there and like read whatever Justice Wagner said or whatever Justice Fish said, right? You want to try to make them better. And I know that sounds super intimidating, you know, making an argument that's even better than what the Supreme Court made, right? Um, but it's doable. As you go through these arguments, you'll find some of these points are a lot more persuasive than others. Some of these points are better than others. And there might be points that, you know, you, you, you know they didn't even come up with, right? Uh, unique arguments that even they did not come up with. And, you know, so some of the best, you know, moot court competitions I've seen, you know, have people making up like very creative arguments, right? Uh, still based in the law, still based on what happened in this case. Um, but, you know, very, very much, you know, framing it differently so that they present a new perspective to the panel of judges, right? So in the beginning, there's a summary, right? And you can sort of go through this. There's a list of cases cited. Um, does, is everyone here like familiar with like how precedents work, how legal precedents work? Yeah, seeing some nods. Yeah. Uh, seeing some head shaking. Uh, Emily, <laughs> uh, is this an unfamiliar sort of thing? No, not familiar, right? Eh? Okay, yeah, so let, let's, let's give a quick overview of how that works. So, you know, the, the idea of uh, precedence, right, is, is basically laws are designed so that um, they're meant to be consistent. We want our laws to be consistent. <laughs> Why do we want them to be consistent? Because if the laws are inconsistent, then we'll have you know anarchy, right? Uh, all these unexplainable things just happening all at once. You wouldn't know what the law is. You could be doing something that's totally innocent the one day, and then it turns criminal the next day, right? So we need to have consistency in law. So in order to have consistency, that means facts, you know, similar cases should have similar results. Right, similar cases should have similar results. So, in terms of understanding, like how to make a legal argument, it's important to understand, like you know, these cases, not just as like you know this is a case, but like in terms of the stories behind these cases. Right, each of these cases are a story, and each of these stories have a lesson, a moral, a theme. Right, it's the same as you know when you're studying English class, right? You know, uh, you know, all of these books that you re read, there's like a theme behind all of them, right? So that theme, 
we call it the ratio. And that's really what you know these cases are for, right? That theme is law. The theme of, of these stories, that's that's what law really is, right? Um, so you know, if you have like a, a fact pattern, for instance, where you know, exact same case like this, right? A husband and a wife, they plan a murder, the wife backs out at the last minute. And in that case, the wife went to jail. What do we have to do in this case? Well, the wife would have to go to jail, right? So, you know, these cases are meant to be compared to the current case so that we can understand, okay, this is what we did in the past, right? This is what we did in the past and we said that was fair. So in order to ensure that we're consistent, we gotta get to the same sort of result now, right? Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of citations and stuff like that here, but I, I wouldn't worry too, too much about it. There's a quick overview here. And then here are the facts, right? So going back to that earlier question about, you know, where are the facts? So here we have like a pretty good breakdown of the facts. Um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff about the family's backstory, about the conversations that they had. And this is all stuff that came out during trial, right? Uh, through the process of examination and cross-examinations. Um, and, you know, you can treat this the same way that you treat facts in like a mock trial. Like a mood is basically like a mock trial, just without the witnesses, without the, you know, evidence, because all that's been established here for you, right? Uh, and with, you know, a bit more complicated uh, and sophisticated legal, you know, legal arguments that you have to make, right? Uh, that require a stronger understanding of the law. So in this particular case, um, you know, they, they give you all the sort of breakdown of these facts. And these facts are super useful. You really want to make sure that your arguments are based on fact, right? Uh, you can be up there arguing this and that, this and that all you want, but unless you root it in like, this is actually what happened, right? Um, you know, your, your arguments aren't going to stick. So going back to like the evidence. So, you know, we can see here the appellant testified that the rest of the date was uneventful, right? Um, oh, actually here, yeah. So on December 31st, according to the appellant, um, her spouse spent the morning working on the computer. Uh, you know, he told her he made a decision. He then dictated some documents to her and she wrote it down like a robot. Right, the husband then left the house uh, and then she realized what was going on. When her spouse returned in the afternoon, she did not agree with the murder-suicide pact and she tore up the documents. And she claimed to understand from her spouse's face that he had resigned himself to abandoning the dark plan. So she thought her husband had changed his mind because his facial expression changed. Um, you know, the Pelham testified that the rest of the day was uneventful. They watched the movie. Mark, the husband, prepared some drink, some popcorn, and then they all fell asleep. Um, so here it is, the physical evidence. So this is the physical evidence that was filed at trial. Uh, there was two torn up documents in the garbage can a handwritten will in the appellant's hand. So in other words, uh, she wrote a will pretty much saying that they were planning to kill themselves, right? Uh, a document on the computer by Marco Liberté in which he told his side story. Another copy of the will on the kitchen island. Three handwritten letters from Gauthier to her friend, Cathy Ouellette. And all these letters mentioned that they were planning on ending their lives. And the last piece of evidence was two empty medicine bottles, right? So there's not a ton of evidence in this case. It's mostly, you know, this is it, right? Um, it's, it's crazy, you know, how, you, you, you know, the trial probably lasted for weeks and weeks where they, you know, grilled and like get, got all the evidence in, right? And here they just sum it up in one sort of quick paragraph for you. Um, but this is super important, right? Because this is, this is what you're going to be using to, to try to make an argument for your client. Um, so, you know, the judicial history is here, but let's think a little bit really about what we're looking for here, right? Remember back to the memo. The main thing that we're interested in here is the defense of abandonment, right? So we can run a quick search. So defense of abandonment. This is really what we're looking for, right? So we got 66 results. That's a lot of results. Um, do you want to just like go through every part where it pops up? Probably not, right? Like here, th these are just like some tags to make it more easily searchable. This is not super important. You just quickly go through this, right? And take a look at when they mentioned the defense of abandonment, right? 
So here, here are some, you know, some stuff. The defense of abandonment can only be submitted to the jury if there is evidence on record that is reasonably capable of supporting the necessary inferences in respect of each of the elements of this defense. Oh, this is a mouthful, right? Um, evidence on record that is reasonably capable of supporting the necessary inferences in respect of each of the elements of this defense. Okay, this is pretty complicated, but again, this is in a short summary, right? So let's see if they break it down a little bit more down the line, right? Um, so this is, yeah, again, like this is the, like just in the very beginning of the case. So th this is all just like quick summaries, right? Um, Yeah, so you know you can start to like you know get a rough sense for like where this idea of the defense of abandonment pops in, right? So this allows you to very quickly go through, right? Um, you know what are the points that are being made, right? She submits that the trial judge erred, the judge made an error in deciding not to show the jury the defense of abandonment, right? So that that's what she's arguing. Um, so this is a pretty good point as well that you, you kind of also have to know, but we're not going to focus too much on this now. When is it appropriate to put a defense to a jury? This is something that, you know, you're going to have to know to argue this case in particular. Um, alternative defenses that are incompatible, this is not relevant. Like I think the memo says you don't take a look at this. And here, you see this and you know this is important. Essential elements of the defense of abandonment, right? Remember, like we're trying to figure out what the correct test is, right? That, that's, that's our job as a lawyer in this situation, to try to figure out what's the correct test. So keep in mind, this is in the majority's decision. So the majority obviously has a very government-centered view, right? There's a huge government bias here. So just keep that in mind as you're reading this, right? Uh, the dissent has a very different perspective. So the defense of abandonment can only be submitted if there's evidence on record reasonably capable of supporting the necessary inferences in respect of each of the elements of the case. Super complicated, okay? Uh, but, you know, I think I think if we wanna simplify it down, like how would you break this down into the simplest form, right? What, is this, what, what does this really mean? Anyone have any ideas? It's kind of tricky, eh? Well, let's take a look. So evidence on record. Yeah, so there has to be evidence, right? That is reasonably capable. So the reasonably thing, I think you can just trim out for the sake of simplicity, right? So you need evidence capable of supporting the necessary inferences. So inferences being the necessary connections, right? The, the, the connections that you're making in respect of each of the elements of the case. In other words, there has to be evidence to support each element. That's really all it means, right? <laughs> you use a lot of big fancy legal words, but you know, half the job of lawyers is really to like just simplify and to cut through all the, you know, big words and to break things down really simply, right? What this really means is, is there evidence for each element, right? Is there some e evidence? It doesn't have to definitively prove that that element is satisfied, right? It doesn't have to prove it. It just has to be possible to support that element. So, you know, in this care, you know, they take a look at some of the case law, right? So they, you know, show you, hey, this is what the previous cases are saying. And here they bring up finally the key elements. So there must be an intention to abandon or withdraw. So there has to be an intention, first of all. Secondly, there must be timely communication of this abandonment. So in other words, you, you have to tell the other person, no, I'm not doing this, right? And finally, the notice communicated must be unequivocal. Anyone know what unequivocal means? Whenever you find a word you don't know the meaning of, and there's a lot of like stuff like this in law, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I find myself doing this all the time, just run a quick Google search. What's unequivocal? Leaving no doubt. That's basically all it means, right? Unequivocal. Uh, so it leaves no doubt. So in other words, you have to intend on quitting the crime. You have to tell them that you intend to quit before a certain point, right? Preferably before the crime happens. That's what it seems to say, right? And then you have to make it unequivocal. In other words, saying, I'm out, I'm done. There's no way I'm going to be back in. It cannot be ambiguous at all. 
So now I'd like to, so, you know, ask the class. Um, I asked for your thoughts earlier, but now I'd like to ask it again. Based on this test, is there a, should Ms. Golchi ha have had the opportunity to present this as a defense? Like, would this have been a legitimate defense for Ms. Golchi to use? What do you think, Phoebe? Or <laughs> Khalil and Kata, if you uh, have any thoughts. Uh, if Phoebe wants to go, she can go. I'm not really sure, so you can go first. All right. Um, well, I at the beginning, I was thinking that it would a, a lesser charge would have been appropriate, but I think the defense should have been able to been used. But I think even if the defense was used, it it wouldn't have really had an impact in that just in just trying to infer. A no, we're not going to do it from a husband's facial expression doesn't seem like the best defense. Yeah, which is a really good point, right? And it kind of speaks to this whole unequivocal thing, right? If it's unequivocal, if it's unambiguous that you left the crime, can you really say like the person got the message if uh, their expression just changed, right? But the counter argument, of course, is that Miss Golchi knows her husband the best, right? She would recognize his facial expressions better than anyone else in the world. So shouldn't we trust her with that? I think regardless, interpreting facial expressions is a very subjective thing. Like there's no definitive, oh, this is what this face means. So she may know him the best, but the meaning of the facial expression is so very subjective and ambiguous. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there are some ambiguities here, but there's another sort of issue here, and it's that this is actually the defense of abandonment as it applies to a different law, as it applies to section 21.2, which is a different law, right? And this is in the memo as well. They describe, you know, this section 21.1 and section 21.2. So it's a, actually, this is not the test necessarily for 21.1. So why don't we use a test for 21.1 instead of 21.2? And uh, just to clarify, the difference between 21.1 and 21.2 is 21.1 is aider and abetter, and then 21.2 is common intention. So 21.1, you actually take action to help the crime, right? 21.2 is you hatch a plan, basically. And they, they, they're, they're two different crimes. But this is the defense of abandonment as was established in all these cases, like White House, Miller and Queen, Kirkness. Um, but it was talking about 21.2, where you make a plan. In this case, it wasn't just a plan. She took actions to do it. So, so why are we using a test for 21-2 instead of 21-1? Because the Crown could get a almost definitive ruling due to the fact that she did do what is described as in 21-2, right? Yeah. So yeah, the Crown obviously does not want 21-2 because it seems that she, there's a good chance that she satisfied it, right? And all there needs to be is a good chance for it to be put to the jury. Right? It doesn't have to 100% work. It just has to be reasonable right, for them to submit it to the jury. Um, but in terms of the reason, so strategically, that's why the Crown wants to say, hey, this is 21-2, right? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, so strategically, like there, there are reasons for arguing you know, for this, but in reality, why are they using 21-2 instead of 21-1? It's because there is no law for 21-1. When you actually help out with a crime, as a party to it, as an aider and a better, as we described, there hasn't been a case like that that's gone to the Supreme Court where there was, you know, like a defensive abandonment. So, you know, it just goes to show like these cases, they're, they're, you know, sort of cutting edge cases, right? There are facts that no one's ever encountered before, issues that have never popped up in Canadian law. Um, and the judges are looking for clarity in terms of like, what do we do? What's the right outcome here, right? So in terms of that, they took a look at a whole bunch of different things. They took a look bunch at a whole bunch of very clever arguments. Uh, there's one argument here, which I really love. Um, and they took this not from a legal case, but from a textbook. Uh, you know, once the arrow is in the air, there is no use wishing never to have let it go. Oh God, let it miss. The archer is guilty when the arrow hits the victim through the heart. So in other words, if you shoot an arrow, you can't just be like, oh, I regret it. Therefore I'm not guilty, right? You shot the arrow, you're responsible for the consequences. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very visual sort of argument. This is a sort of argument that, you know, you should be trying to make, right? 
you want to like you don't want to go up there and talk about like abstract law you don't want to go up there and talk about like really complex things per se you want to try to break it down bring it down to the real world right how would this sort of rule work in the real world and this argument is saying look if we just use this three-step test right then theoretically someone could just be like oh god please let it miss right and their repentance is enough to, for them to get out of it the supreme court says no can't do that right and they you know found some other cases to justify like this case where uh, a wife hired a assassin to murder her husband she paid him a bunch of money she gave him the details to go murder her husband and then to try to you know cancel it she just left the message cancel on their answering device right and in this case it's a quebec court of appeal case so it's not quite as important the supreme court but it has some sway uh, and in this case, you know, the, the court was like, no, you can't do that. You can't hire an assassin to kill someone, send them a text message, no. And then be like, oh, no, I, I didn't do nothing wrong, right? So here the Supreme Court says this is the correct test. So the first three steps are the exact same. And then the Supreme Court says for 21-1, where there's an aider and a better, where there's someone who's actually actively helping out, this is the test. There's a fourth step that the accused took in a manner proportionate to his or her participation in the commission of the plan offense, reasonable steps in the circumstances to neutralize or otherwise cancel out. So, so this is really what the argument boils down to, right? And Justice Fish's dissent, basically to sum it up, he's saying we should just keep the three-step test. The Supreme Court says, no, we need a fourth step for aiding and abetting, right? This is really what the case comes down to. And you know, when you do get the chance, I would really urge you to check this case out as well as check out the memo. You can find it on our website at dominionlocktrial.com. Uh, but there's a bunch of really interesting arguments about this fourth step, right? Because this fourth step, we call it the neutralization step. It requires that if you're a part of something bad, you gotta take steps to neutralize the bad things that you did, right? To try to prevent it. And you can see why the Supreme Court wants this, right? They want people to take responsibility for their actions. They want people to try to cancel out a really bad crime if they took part in it, to try to reduce the likelihood of that crime happening. But what's the issue with this then? Any ideas? Why do we not want this fourth requirement here? Any ideas? Yeah. Joanna, very good. Yeah, it's not always possible, right? That's a great answer. So imagine you're Miss Golchie, right? You're Miss Golchie in that situation. Or you know what? Let's let's use another example. I'm taking part in a bank robbery, right? With a few people. I'm taking part in a bank robbery. Uh, and I provide the guns and I provide the map, the blueprint to the vault, right? And then I decide, I'm like, hey, I don't want to be a part of this. This is bad. You know, I don't want to be a criminal. So I want to leave the crime. So I go online. I'm like, okay, how do I get out of crime? I say there has to be an, inten an intention. I'm like, okay, I can do that. There has to be a timely communication. So I can just tell them that like, you know, I'm not doing it. Yeah, I can do that too. It has to be unequivocal. Okay. So I just got to tell them like, yeah, there's no way I'm going through with this. Right. That, that, that sounds reasonable. But now it says in a manner proportionate to his or her participation, reasonable steps to neutralize or cancel out the effects. So what does that mean? That means I got to go to these really scary gangsters and be like, hey guys, you know how I gave you all those guns? I'd like those guns back. You know how I uh, gave you, you know, that map of the bank vault? I kind of want that map back. And if you don't give them back to me, I might have to call the cops on you. <laughs> Can you see now how this fourth step might actually be kind of problematic? I mean, personally, if I were in that case, I would just go through with a robbery at that point. I'm not facing these scary people and going, hey, can I please have my guns back? Um, so anyways, this is how you read a case. Uh, there's a lot of other materials on our website when it comes to, you know, putting together arguments um, and, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, you have the right format and stuff. But this is basically it. Uh, so as a reminder, if you are on the appellate side, you always look at the dissent right? 
the disagreement. If you're on the respondent side, you always look at the majority, the main decision. So with that, I think that brings this class to an end. Uh, I would like to thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, this has been really fantastic. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can visit our website at dominionmocktrial.com in order to register. Uh, so I will shoot the link into the chat so you can go check it out. Um, we will be working on a different case for the competition itself, but you will get a good amount of time to work on it. So, you know, these cases, usually students get about two or three weeks to work on it. So you have a good amount of time to work through these cases slowly, read through the memo to get a better idea on what are the arguments that you should be bringing forward and how should you frame them so that they're the most persuasive. Uh, with that, thank you all so much. Um, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank you. Hi, I actually just have a quick question. Um, it doesn't really, it's not like a general thing. So like everyone can leave and stuff, but. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let me stop the recording.